We come to worship in these strange buildings um, with these extraordinary spires and these uh, um, e e extraordinary kind of architectures. So what, why do we, what, what is the point of it? Transcendence. It means that, that the God that we know, the God that we believe in, is somehow or another bigger than, than me. That it encompasses, he encompasses the entire world, and that world is a world of mystery, uh, sometimes of unanswerability and unknowingness. That God is bigger, that holds the, the whole flow of life and the world in a way which is beyond me. The scriptural narrative is very much one of community. So, for example, the whole narrative in the Old Testament and New Testament is the people of God, not just me. Okay, the, the, the God acts in the world and calls a people to himself, not just, um, not just a, a community which is so individualistic that that sense of community has actually gone. So community is a hugely big, big part of it. We say in the creed, we believe in one, one God. It's a community thing. Those are very strong um, kind of upward words, aren't they? From us to this transcendent being. We praise, we glorify, we exalt. So in, in terms of uh, those words, it's just because God is. It's, it's, it's integral to, to the nature of how we understand stand God. For example, we are created beings. Okay, and our, our context of how we understand ourselves is within that idea of creatorship. You could go on with that about, uh, about who, who we are in our journey with God. That gives us what our identity and what our self-understanding is. So like the St. Augustine kind of thing, uh, that, that God has created a, a God-filled space and that only God can, can actually fill that. Thanksgiving very much part of, uh, of, 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 of Christian language. You know, the whole idea of Eucharistia is that one of profound thanksgiving. It's a kind of a thanksgiving which is, is deeply rooted in, in, in meaning. In the Christian tradition, if it, is to be, if it is to be faithful to itself, it is a deeply historic one. It builds on the learning of the, of the generations. Confession. Owning is back again to what you were saying about owning who we are, that idea of what our, our identity is. Okay, one of the things that I was going to say to you is if you look at this, there's nothing distinctively Christian. So one of the things, the tasks of musicians, of clergy, of the whole people of God is to define in worship our task. What is it that incorporates all of these things? but also takes it to a different place and starts from the distinctively Christian. There's stuff that's needed for, for, for worship. So there's something about at the heart of what we're, we're doing that all these other things have at its very centre, and it, it relates to, to the point that you made earlier, that we're telling a distinctive story. That story is not a new one. It's continually evolving, as it were, but it's coming from a source that's none other than God's dealings, of, with, with, uh, God's dealings with his people throughout the generations. In the Christian tradition, there is a hugely strong emphasis on word. What else? So something to do with the things we experience in worship have behind them. A, a deeper meaning. They're pointing to something which is, is beyond itself. So bread is bread, but it's pointing not to itself. It's pointing to, to something else. Our churches, even the way that we, 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 we construct our churches, they're not practical. They're not there for practical reasons. They're there actually for symbolic reasons. Action is, is hugely Im important because the Christian tradition, even the Psalms, some of them are written from the perspective of walking, of processing. I will go to the altar of God, even unto the God of my joy and gladness. That was to be walked to. These are great processional Psalms to go up the, the hill of the Lord. I suggest to you that what makes Christian worship distinctively Christian is that in all its aspects and in all you do as church musicians, that it is reflective of the purposes and the character of God. 
even that, that heading takes us into a really important thing. It's to do with the, with the nature, the being of God, and also to the sense of unity which God invites his people to actually be. Now I'm going to give you some little headers here. You can add a lot more. One of them is the most fundamental understanding of God is that God is love, but not just leaving it there. The distinctiveness of the Judeo-Christian tradition is that God's character is love in action. Now, and that's not just a trendy thing to actually say. How we understand the Judeo-Christian God is that this God breaks into the scene of history. Why do we have the curious name of Pontius Pilate in the Creed? It fixes it, all these great actions of God, it fixes it in an historical particular period in, in time. So what it's saying is this God acts in human history, breaks in to this scene of time. That is the first thing in Christian understanding which is distinctive. What's the big actions of God which feed into the New Testament? Okay, this extraordinarily uh, dramatic story of, of, of uh, couched in this great uh, kind of sense of redemption of the people of Israel that are, are in captivity and the, the Red Sea opens up and God brings them through and they are brought through the promised land. Incarne means in Latin in, in the flesh. So therefore, God acts in human history in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but most profoundly in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, this, therefore, this God is to be known in this person who has walked among us, who is someone that at a particular historical period you could meet, you could see, people talk to. The Gospels are a record of that actual person. But this has other meanings for Christian worship as well, in the sense that God acts through this world, acts through human beings, but acts through stuff. Do you understand what I mean? Acts through stuff, uses stuff in the world, as it were, to communicate and to draw his people together in nurture, in nourishment, and in upbuilding. Bread, what's, what's more common? Okay, in the ancient world or in, in today's world. It's not fancy stuff. It, so therefore, bread becomes something of profound meaning. So, so the, the God who, is, who breaks into this scene of time is validating of the world in which he made. It's to do with the fact that we understand God as being incarnational. Now that is fundamental to understanding uh, Christian liturgy and Christian worship, and ultimately what you do and what I do and what the whole people of God do in what they're, they're struggling to, to make real um, worship. Uh, uh, God is redemptive. His entire purpose is towards the salvation and the redeeming of hu humanity and of the world, actually. We used to limit it to understanding just about our souls, that which happens after death, that kind of thing. But the whole purposes of God are towards his creation as a whole. You, you, you know the passages in scripture which talk about the whole creation groans. None of this is by our own efforts. So God is therefore proactive. I'll use this old-fashioned phrase, which is a good phrase. God is therefore grace. That means not just nice, okay, not only graceful. It actually means that God, this is all unwarranted. This is all free. This is all at the initiative and of the action of, of God. Everything we do in worship is a response to this revelation. The works of God, what God has done, we are therefore responding. We are called to make a response to that, to be challenged uh, um, by it, and also to, to live our lives in response to what God has done, the mighty acts of God in the Jew Jewish tradition and in the Christian tradition.